Well, hello, um, I'm Martin Green from UNSW Sydney. And today I've been asked to talk to you about silicon heterojunctions. And what I'm particularly interested in is how close can they get to 29% silicon cell efficiency, which is the limit on silicon cell performance. So the photos down the bottom just show the iconic Sydney Opera House, our research lab at the University of New South Wales, and on the bottom right, our solar industrial research facilities where we do technology transfers to industry and evaluate industrial equipment and so on. So this shows the, the key technologies that are battling for market dominance at the moment. And uh, on the right is shown, you know, the, the best uh, results from large area cells with each of these technologies. And uh, right out the front uh, are the heterojunctions. So 26.6 for a large area IBC, interdigitated back contact cell, 26.3, not far behind for a two-side contact uh, head heterojunction cell. So if you if you look at these uh, two curves, you'll see on the on the right, far right of that curve where the arrow, red arrow is pointing, they're very close to the fundamental limit that you would expect from a silicon solar cell in terms of voltage. So that's a really strong point. Um, the fill factor of the um, two-sided contact device is getting quite large, 86.6 .6 is the most recent result, so getting really high, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but the really weak point, at least for the uh, two-sided contact device, is the current. It's the lowest of all these contenders, and I'll also talk a little bit about that. So in the fullness of time, um, we're expecting the voltages of these other technologies, you know, PERC and TOPCON, to um, to improve. So, you know, since heterojunctions is pushing up against the barrier, you know, the question is, will these others catch heterojunction VOC? And if the current stays low, will they um, get past heterojunctions in terms of efficiency? All these cells, excepting the PERC one, are made on N-type wafers. But in case you think uh, N-types might have some type of monopoly on high performance, there's just been some results over the last couple of weeks that um, have announced good heterojunction results on P-type wafers, gallium-doped uh, P-type wafers. So one group reported 24.5%, uh, and just a week or so later, Longi um, reported 25.5% with a P-type heterojunction device. Voltage and current very similar to the N-type devices. The only real difference is the fill factor, and we might talk a little bit about why that is the case. So getting back to what the fundamental limits on performance are, you know, we've been able to do these calculations for about 40 years now. So um, I did one of the first um, back in 1983, and uh, for a 150 micron thick cell, I calculated 29.7%. And just a couple of months later, TJ and Ali, Alia did a similar calculation. They got 29.7. The most recent calculation, using the most recent parameters I can do, uh, gets 29.5. So you might think nothing too much has changed, but um, all the parameters that go into the calculation have moved around, but you still get the same result. So this is, this is for a cell that's perfect in terms of surfaces and there's no um, non-intrinsic recombination in the, in the cell bulk and this is the best you can do. So the voltage is quite notable, 757 millivolts and we'll come back to that. But the fill factor is quite enormous, 89.1% from a silicon cell, just sort of sky high. But we'll, we'll, we'll have a look at how close we might be able to get to that. So just looking at what happens when you deviate from that perfection, you know, the idealized silicon solar cell. If you look at what happens if you decrease the wafer quality, the chart shows, the, the curve on the right just shows what happens if you change from the perfect wafer to one with five milliseconds defect uh, lifetime. And you can see it bumps the curve around. But surprisingly, um, current doesn't change, voltage only changes slightly. It's the fill factor that takes the hit. Um, it turns out you need at least 30 milliseconds to get a, a fill factor or at least a pseudo fill factor in the absence of resistance losses of uh, greater than 88%. So um, high lifetime is needed, not for high voltages or current, 
but for high fill factor, and we'll have a bit of a closer look at that. The other thing that you need is really good surfaces. So this what shows what happens if you add um, recombination of the surfaces. It's normally specified in terms of a diode saturation current density or a J naught contribution. So the curve on the right, the black curve models what happens to the ideal device. This time you've got perfect wafers, but you've got surfaces with 10 femtoamp per centimeter squared, 10 to the minus 15 amps per square centimeter. Saturation current density uh, contribution from the surfaces. And you can see that that knocks about uh, not only the fill factor in this case, but also the open circuit voltage. We just have a bit of a closer look at this. That uh, 10 femtoamps is um, shown here as the vertical uh, dashed line. And, uh, you know, the voltage is quite respectable. Was it 630 something millivolts? Fill factor about 86% is, you know, idealized in the absence of resistance effects. Um, but uh, what it really shows, like if you're over the far right side where the J naught contribution is quite large, you can have quite large improvements in voltage and nothing much happens with the fill factor. But once you get into the regime that we're now in, you know, 636 millivolts plus voltages, you get a change. The fill factor can depend quite heavily upon the, um, um, the voltage value you get. And this all depends upon the cell going into high injection. So um, if you restrict yourself to an IDLT factor of one, which is the prevailing IDLT factor in low injection conditions, you're stuck at fill factors that are much lower down here. So a necessary condition for getting these very high fill factors, like 89.1% for the limiting device, is a device operate in high injection at its operating point. And um, that's an important consideration. So we've got what I'm calling high injection fill fa factor supercharging. So there's a 4% relative boost between operating in low injection and high injection, even if, you, if you've got these massive 750 plus millivolt uh, open circuit voltages. And that's the region I think that we'll see heterojunctions tap increasingly to over the coming few years, next few years. And uh, some companies like Hanergy were the first to sort of approach this territory, but Longi has actually now surpassed the limit on an N equals one ideality factor, um, the maximum possible fill factor you can get with that ideality factor, and now reaching this uh, high injection territory with their devices, 86.6% .6 with their latest devices shown there as the upper arrow. And what you'll notice is you're getting the very small increases in voltage, the, the voltage these cells demonstrated uh, correspond to the blue line at the top. So going from energy with a, I think it was a 747 millivolts to Longi's recent result was 751, you know, just a measurable four millivolts improvement in um, open circuit voltage. You're getting this massive increase in fill factor, like one and a half percent gain in uh, in fill factor. And that's a result of this high injection supercharging, fill factor supercharging. So you need to be in high injection and what constraints does that place on doping? And they're not too severe, actually. It turns out that you should be able to get fill factors over 88% if you're above two ohm centimeter for N-type material, but you've got even a bigger range for P-type you can go down to 0.8 um, centimeter P-type material, which is 10 times higher doping level than the um, corresponding N-type value shown there, um, you know, and still um, maintain high fill factors. So P-type has a slight advantage in terms of getting these very high fill factors. So it turns out there's actually an optimum doping uh, to make, get maximum efficiency from a silicon cell. It's not a very um, strong peak at the optimum, but it turns out there's an optimum around four ohm centimeter. And uh, this was worked out by Andreas Fell from Fraunhofer and myself quite recently. But between two and 13 ohm centimeter P-type silicon, you can do better than intrinsic material in terms of the efficiency you can get out from the cell. If you go to N-type, you're always below the efficiency from intrinsic. So most of these limiting efficiency calculations in the past have been done assuming intrinsic material gave the best 
that in fact a slight p-type doping is the optimum even with intrinsic though you're getting quite high carrier concentrations like 7 by 10 to the 15 per cubic centimetre at the maximum power point. And these injected carriers are reducing the um, sheet resistivity of the wafer. So that corresponds to about 0.5 ohm centimetre or 36 ohms per square for 150 micron thick wafer. So you've got quite a bit of lateral conductivity to work with um, um, with, these, um, with these materials. Okay, moving on. Uh, the other area there's been recent developments is in terms of contact selectivity. So if you define J0 and a contact resistance in terms of the total cell area, if you um, change the area of partial contact as shown there, the brown region there, as you change the area of that contact, that product will stay constant. Um, so obviously an important cell parameters that's been captured in this parameter defined by ISFH, the selectivity normally take the log of it because you're dealing with uh, very big numbers. So it's got a physical meaning shown over here, although I won't go into that. But if you plot uh, J naught of experimental contacts versus the contact uh, resistivity, you get points scattered all over the shop, such as shown here. So diffusions, which are the triangles, tend to have high J naught values, but fairly low contact resistance as shown here. The uh, brown or red color is for uh, p-type and the blue color is for n-type and um, you know other technologies the circle show um, polysilicon um, tunneling contacts and they have a fair range of parameters and um, here we have amorphous silicon uh, over here um, but the the selectivities work out as straight lines on this graph so this is a selectivity of 15 that this point here lies on so if we have a look, at, a look at that point 15, it turns out for each value of the selectivity, you can work out the limiting efficiency that you can obtain from a solar cell due to that. That's probably not too surprising. You just have these two parameters and you'll find an optimum combination of them and the corresponding efficiency. So there's nothing really magic there, but for um, a selectivity of 15, you end up with just over 29% efficiency. So 29% is this dotted line here. So just over that. And um, for that uh, combination of the optimum combination of parameters, you only have to specify one of, one of them, specify one of them, of course, because you know their product. So the contact uh, resistivity is normally what's specified. So you need about, what is it, less than 0.1 ohm centimeter squared contact resistivity. So for this particular P type polysilicon contact to reach that type of efficiency, you need um, to move it down this curve to this point here to get that specific value of the contact resistivity. So in this case here, you need to have about 10% contact area, which will increase the contact resistivity of this um, particular value here by a factor of 10, so down to this value, while uh, decreasing the J0 by a factor of 10 as well. So you land up at this point here. So, you know, that's the whole idea of these selectivities. You can work out the partial contact there. silicon we'll see that they're nearly already on this uh, dotted line which is the locus that you need to follow um the locus that you need to follow um uh, to obtain the maximum efficiency so they they're designed we'll see that they're designed as full area contacts which is the reason that that occurs they've been optimized as full area contacts so you don't um partial contacts out of interest because you've designed the device for a full area contact on both sides Okay, moving on. Um, as I mentioned, the, the, you know, the, the real um, problem, well, I guess it is a problem, with the heterojunction technology is the low current. And this just shows the EQE of those record cells shown earlier. So the, the heterojunctions you are know, right up there, only 1% away from the maximum po possible voltage, about 3% from the maximum possible fill factor and 8% uh, from the maximum po possible current density and the EQE curve shows why. It's the worst of the all the uh, contenders uh, right across the whole spectrum, but particularly at the uh, blue and UV wavelengths. And of course, the reason for that is these layers on the top, the uh, transparent conductor and the doped amorphous silicon layer at the top surface. So one big development over recent years has been going from a from front junction de design 
like all the Sanyo uh, heterojunction cells were front contact designs with a P plus amorphous silicon region, N, N plus, so the traditional type of design. But everyone now has switched to this rear junction design where you have a N plus amorphous silicon at the top, N type wafer, and a P plus at the back. And the reason for that is that with this uh, rear junction structure, you can use the whole wafer to conduct the current to the contacts. You don't have to rely on the TCO. So you can relax the properties of the TCO. You can make it less resistive and then hence less of a problem in terms of absorption and so on by uh, using the wafer for that lateral conductivity. So these diagrams down here, you know, the references are shown for all these figures somewhere or other on the slide. But, you know, it, traditionally the current in a heterojunction flew, um, flew up to the top TCO layer and then laterally to the contacts. Whereas with the rear junction device, you can make the wafer do a lot of the work with a uh, current sort of flowing over to the contacts through the wafer and the TCO requirements relaxed. So, um, uh, Longi was already using that in their uh, their devices here, so nothing to gain from that. But this other paper that I show here by Lee et, al et alia, they've gone one step further. So they have actually um, removed the TCO entirely from the cell and contacted directly to the amorphous silicon. There's a bit of a trick involved in doing that, which you can find out about by reading their paper. But... Um, by doing that, they've been able to increase the EQE of the cells, particularly in the blue and UV. So even better than Longi, even though the cell probably wasn't as strong in the Longi and other areas that contribute to high EQE. So they were able to get a whole milliamp per square centimeter gain by uh, getting rid of the TCO. So not only uh, um, going to the rear junction device, but also... Um, also getting rid of the front TCO. This is a very busy slide, but it just sort of shows, it shows a matrix of combinations of different I layer thick across the top here. And then these are different P type top layer thicknesses. So this is an old fashioned front junction cell we're looking at here. But I just wanted to draw your attention to this segment here, the, the uh, third segment along with the thickest amorphous silicon top layer, 18 nanometers thick, really thick. <laughs> um, but the voltages, if you look at the open circuit voltages here, it's the highest. So high um, P layer thicknesses gives you the highest voltages. And then if you look at the thicknesses of the I layer that are giving the best voltages, the thickest I layers as well. So thick, 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 if you want high voltage, but that interferes with the... Um, uh, resistance of the devices. So with high, with thick layers, which is, uh, I guess, the red and black in this, with the high thickness combination here, you get uh, high voltages, but you tend to, um, uh, you can lose performance um, because as the thickness of these layers goes up, the voltage goes up, the short circuit current goes down and the fill factor also goes down due to the increased resistance. So this is what I mentioned before, that the best devices have been optimized to get that optimal trade-off between the um, J naught of these um, amorphous silicon layers and the uh, thickness of the I layer. So just looking um, what else is being done to improve efficiency. So this is a recent development as well as being not just depositing one intrinsic layer, but depositing two on both front and back in, in this case here. And um, the reason for that is, uh, is quite subtle, but um, this is a paper by um, Hanergy that appeared uh, about this time last year, but they did a lot of careful work along with um, some strong characterization groups, including people from high university, UNSW, but um, they were able to look at the interface between the crystalline silicon wafer and the deposited amorphous intrinsic layer. And what they found was that what tended to happen was that you've got some regions of epitaxial growth of the um, amorphous silicon upon the uh, silicon wafer. And uh, if these were uh, just uh, randomly nucleated, you tended to get micro twins within this um, uh, epitaxial layer grown on trop. So this diagram here de demonstrates what's happening in this high resolution TEM image here. 
So uh, if you study this carefully, you can deduce that this is what's happening with the individual atomic arrangements. So those are those green and yellow colored regions aren't good in that they represent regions of high recombination along the interface. So that's going to knock your VOC down down. And we saw that VOC also knocks down your available fill factor quite dramatically. So um, by adding this extra intrinsic layer, you're able to suppress this type of nucleation. So you can um, design that first eye layer for um, suppression of epitaxy growth. The second eye layer then is for surface passivation. So you can pull out all the stops with it. So by doing so, um, Energy were able to get uh, increases in both VOC and fill factor. Both went up by 0.3%, and that helped them get their um, their you know groundbreaking 25%. You know, first heterojunction cell over 25% uh, efficiency. You know, by um, studying this type of effect. The other thing they found, you know, when you texture 100 silicon, you expose 111 crystallographic planes. Um, but it's not a good idea to have those planes exactly orientated 111, uh, according to Hanergy. So um, what they found was that with a, this, this just shows the crystal structure for a, a surface that is 111 orientated. So the green line just shows the 111 crystallographic planes and the one of them is orientated parallel to the surface. But that tends to encourage random nucleation of this epitaxial growth. However, if you tilt slightly off, as shown here, you, what you tend to get is these periodic atomic steps in the surface to accommodate the um, off-axis orientation of the wafer. So on the right here is shown, uh, you know, one, one, one planes are slightly tilted in this structure here. So the, act, the uh, wafer isn't quite 100 orientated along the surface. So um, what that tends to do is provide a nucleation point for these apotextual layers. So instead of having random nucleation and uncontrolled micro twins, you can then control where the um, nucleation occurs and um, hence have control over nano twins using that approach. So the template, template provided by these atomic st steps encourages the correct stacking along the interface. Well, that uh, brings me to the end of the talk. I'd just like to talk about what options we've got for bringing heterojunction cell efficiency up from, um, you know, the 26 type values to much closer to 29%. Um, so I think we'll see, you know, commercially continual improvements to certainly above 26% and probably beyond 27%, um, you know, in production with heterojunction. So, you know, maybe by the end of the decade. So, you know, one requirement is better wafers. So need better than 30 millisecond lifetime consistently from these wafers. And we've seen enormous improvements in wafer quality over the last decade. And I think that'll continue. So maybe with gallium, there's more potential for improvement because it's been less explored than phosphorus dope material. Um, so maybe P-type will catch up. Well, P-type wafers will catch up with N-type. Um, but the reason that you want that high, high lifetimes is not for better current or voltage because you're nearly at the limits with voltage and um, it's absorption that's limiting the current. Um, but it's to, to get this increased fill factor. So, you know, each millivolt improvement in voltage is worth chasing because it gives you a bigger jump in the fill factor. Similarly with surfaces. So getting the J0 contribution below two femtoamps a square centimetre also, you know, not for voltage or current, but to get this really supercharged fill factor. So there is room for better contacts. So you need to reduce the um, J0 and contact resistance associated with the contacts that'll take your efficiency potential from above 28% where it presently lies to something like 29%, you know, to get the full uh, available potential from the material. So you need about an order of magnitude improvement in the uh, contact selectivity values um, over what we're seeing now. So I'm not sure what you have to do there, but um, you know, paying careful attention to the intrinsic layer and uh, and so on may uh, achieve that. So um, the real issue, I think, with heterojunctions in the long run is decreased top absorption. So I think eliminating the ITA, as has been shown feasible, you know, is one approach. 
And then maybe even patterning the amorphous silicon. So rather than having a full area amorphous silicon on the top side, that would be the N-type amorphous silicon, maybe have it patterned, you know, to let the light through um, while um, pushing down its contact resistivity so that you don't raise the resistance of the cell. So, you know, I think that's for the long term. But the, the big scope for near-term improvement in, in uh, heterojunction device is improving the fill factor, um, or at least the pseudo fill factor, towards the high injection Auger limit by uh, cutting down um, the J0 and uh, defect lifetime contributions. So thanks very much for your attention. That's the end of the talk. Great. Thank you, Martin. Again, that was um, absolutely fascinating. It seems that things are moving um, at a, a rapid rate. Um, so I just had a, a couple of questions. Um, where in, in, in mass production at the moment, um, is, is, is the wafer quality still the limiting factor? Um, do you think we still need a, a, a few years before we've got sufficient wafer quality that we can start to implement some of the um, you know, different um, deposition or different layer um, processes that you spoke about? Yes, yeah, so I, I think at uh, your Hetero Junction conference last year, you know, Verizon complained about not being able to get consistent N-type wafer quality from their suppliers. So, you know, obvious um, need for improving the quality, which, which I think um, can be done. So it's only a matter of, of time, I think, before we'll see that. And uh, I note now that a lot of N-type wafer producers are using 12N or parts per trillion uh, purity silicon. And a lot of the new polysilicon plants have been designed to produce that higher grade of silicon, you know, specifically for the N-type market. And heterojunction is a technology that can take most advantage of improved wafer quality. So that's the technology that will really benefit from uh, pushing to, um, you know, better quality polysilicon material used in the uh, wafer preparation. Um, so, yeah, I think I think that uh, is going to be the big push. So I can see um, solar ending up with these beautiful wafers, you know, much better than even used in microelectronics with these really high lifetimes. And and hopefully the gallium can follow the, the phosphorus dope material through as well. So having this pure grade of polysilicon available, there may be some way you can use that to uh, improve gallium wafer lifetimes as well. Yeah, and, and then just uh, finally, um, so one of the um, limiting factors in terms of um, mass production on uh, large area cells has been um, deposition uh, equipment um, you know, in terms of, of whether it was amorphous in the past or um, you know, some of the more exotic materials. Um, is, is this something that you think will be, you, you spoke about different, you know, different layering, patterned amorphous, um, removing TCOs, different um, TCO layers. Um, is, is this something that you think will be um, relatively easy to go from, um, you know, R&D into mass production, or is this a, um, something that will you know, potentially be a stumbling block? Yeah, I, I think uh, getting rid of the top TCO would be a blessing. You know, you haven't got the issue of indium supply to the same extent. And, uh yeah, you, you end up with better cells. Yeah. So uh, I think, um, you know, that's probably a very productive route for the industry to follow. But I, but I personally think the main stumbling block with heterojunctions now is the silver use. And, um, you know, a local company SunDrive just announced 26.1% efficiency with a with a plated heterojunction cell in conjunction with uh, Maxwell. And, um, you know, I, I think you really need a transition to something like that because the uh, silver usage is just too extreme uh, to be uh, cost competitive with uh, Topcon or, or Perk. Yeah, it's, it's, going to be, it's going to be fascinating to see the, the changes. Um, so, uh, Martin, again, you know, thank you very much. I know that um, lots of people will be interested to see um, or to listen to your talk. And again, you know, thank you very much. And um, anyone that wants to get in touch and ask questions, then um, we'll, we'll pass them all through to, to Martin. So uh, Martin, thank you again. Thank you.